morning and happy Sabbath. So glad to see so many faces in the crowd today. Like the pastor said, my name is Michael Charles. I am a former National Football League player and a current boys dean at Jefferson Christian Academy. Uh, Jefferson Christian Academy is one of our oldest Adventist institution in Jefferson, Texas. Uh, we were uh, started in 1914. 1914, we just started, we just served our 101 year anniversary this year, and it's been a blessing. Uh, it's my first year with them. I called them up, and uh, my wife, <laughs> my wife, who had, as you'll see in my testimony, she's like my angel, my living angel. And, uh, you know, she's always looking on sites, and she's looking on the uh, Outpost Centers International site. And it's um, a site for uh, Adventist missions and for people who want to do mission work. And we're missionary-minded. You know, we don't, we don't work for the world at all. We work strictly for God. And when I tell people that, you know, they, they smile. They think it's just a, a cliche, I work for God. But I truly work for God. Amen. You know, I... Um, we do this work not out of, out of money, but all out of love and out of his direct commandments. Uh, we, um, before coming to Jefferson, we were in Hermosa, South Dakota. How many have been there? <laughs> Hermosa, South Dakota. No teams there. I've never been there before in my life. But as soon as I uh, got consecrated as a medical missionary, the Lord sent me out there. And so I was working as their director of development and trying to get lifestyle guests coming out there. In Hermosa is one of our um, lifestyle centers. And our lifestyle centers serve people from around the world with various stages of lifestyle diseases. And we treat them and bring them, in a lot, of, a lot of cases, bring them back with natural remedies and natural methods. And the first thing we do is the first thing Satan learned to attack us with. He attacked us with our diet, and we changed that diet. And so when we get them on a plant-based diet, we give them some exercise, we break out. We have eight natural doctors that are at our Adventist institutions, our lifestyle centers. And you, know, you have Dr. Nutrition and Dr. Exercise, <laughs> Dr. Water, right? And Dr. Sunshine, Dr. Temperance, that's the one we always got to work with, Dr. Air, Dr. Rest. And the best doctor, the one who ties all the other doctors together, is Dr. Trust, trust in God. And so we bring those things, and we take people back to that, take them back to Eden and how it originally was for. Because God didn't want us suffering, didn't want us in pain, didn't want our arteries clogged up. No, he didn't want us obese. He didn't want us tired. We can't walk up steps. He didn't want us not to be able to play with our children. If you read the Bible, when he called Moses... He was four score, and his strength weighed not. I'd like to get the four. I just, we're just happy to get the four score. We're just happy to get the four score. So I spent the thing. I had a beautiful, what I can see to be beautiful, the Lord had put it on my heart. But every time I come to speak in a new place, Satan attacks me. Satan always attacks me, but he doesn't get under me. He doesn't ruffle me at all. I just go ahead and we just go. The Lord says, you know, just give you the words. I brought you some pictures and, you know, kind of why he was a little pictures. But the Lord said, just give them the words. Just let them know and they'll understand. They'll make a mental picture. So before I start talking about myself, let me talk to you a little bit about Jefferson Christian Academy. It's a high school, a boarding high school. So now your youngins can go from the eighth grade to Jefferson, Texas, in the piney woods of East Texas, Northeast Texas, where its median temperature is about 70 degrees. And the tall pines, nice cool air, we block the sun. We have a full cafeteria. It's a co-ed institution. We have a boys' dorm and a girls' dorm. We have a full church and a chapel, and then a classroom building, an administration building with our classrooms there. You have all kinds of subjects, science, biology, religion, math, English, 
all kinds of subjects there. I'm also the PE instructor, so you come there and get some shape. <laughs> some shape. Uh, I told him before I got there that I really don't coach, so I don't really coach the kids there in competitive sports. Uh, we find that uh, biblically that's not a, a correct way for us to be, and I didn't realize that until I became a biblical person. While I was a worldly person, I thought that's all there was, was this kind of way of living and being in sports. Now that I'm a biblical person, I think differently, and I try to share that with the youth of the day. Um, we've been there, my wife and I, my children. Uh, right across the street from there is an elementary school. So my kids are able to go to the elementary school, and they're looking forward to coming to the high school. At the high school, you know, I, like I said, I'm the boys dean and the director of uh, the religious activities that happen on our campus. I make sure our campus is steeped in the present truth. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As kids come to there, we, free, we factor them out. If they go through our school for four years, they're able to go to schools such as our, our Adventist universities. A lot of them go to King College. A lot of them go to Southwestern. Uh, a lot of them go to Baylor. You know, just branch out. They don't have to go to a Adventist college. They can go to any college, but they have the equipments and the skill to either go into the missionary work or into, you know, higher education. Either one. We're starting a new program next year, uh, which I'm trying to spearhead a medical missionary work. You know, uh, Sister White tells us that that work should be the right hand of the gospel. And so we're going to send children now to preach the good news the leading way in, in a lot of situations, is going to be our health message. Because there are going to be people ailing. You know, people sick, tired, worn, beat down. We can bring them back with our natural way by being thoroughly immersed in our message. As I said, I'm here, I'm from humble beginnings. Born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Newark, New Jersey, in the projects of Stella Home Harvesting Projects. You know, I grew up there, and during my years there, I uh, excelled in sports. You know, when you're in the inner city, that's the only way to go. You know, unless you're going to go out and you're going to try to get paid and, and go out and rob people or, or sell or do illegal things to get quick money, I chose to do things. I chose stardom and fame. I wanted to be great in people's eyes. I want people to see me and envy me. What does that sound like? I had a better way. I had the only way. My father was from Trinidad. Trinidad, amen. <laughs> my father's from Trinidad. And so I see my Trinity people in the house. <laughs> and I have several, uh, several of my, my dear cousins, all my cousins are from Trinidad. And uh, I've been to Trinidad Island several times. I've played in Carnival. And, uh, I really, I really enjoyed it out there, and um, my wife also is an island lady, uh, not Trini though, she is from Tonga in the uh, South Pacific, just out there, just outside of New Zealand, and so um, Trini and Tonga are in the house, <laughs> and my kids now have just become a beautiful mixture of, of both those nations, and we are blessed to have them all. I have a, uh, my, young, my oldest son is Malik. He's 11. Uh, my daughter is Latai. She is 9, going to be 10 in a couple of months. My youngest son is James. He's 6, will be 7 next month. And then my, oldest boy, my youngest boy is David Elijah, who just turned a uh, little over a year old a couple of weeks ago. So you hear him blurting out. Sometimes he sees Daddy up here speaking. He just wants to yell out. And reach for me. And sometimes, one time I was preaching, he's come crawling down the aisle. I said, I hadn't made the call yet. <laughs> but, he came, but he came on down. He came on down. God bless him. Um, my wife and I have been married now uh, 14 years. The Lord has blessed every day of it. Every day is like the first day. <clears throat> you know, as I left Newark and I grew up playing ball, I excelled in the sports, I became an all state player. And so now the colleges start to come after me. And so I had colleges from all over the country, all over the East Coast mostly coming after me, and I accepted a scholarship to Syracuse University. Anybody know what Syracuse is? 
Syracuse, New York. They've been known for their basketball players, but you know, I went there to try to uh, enhance their football team. I played with some great Hall of Famers. You might have known some names like Art Monk, and you know, some other Hall of Famers have been there, Floyd Little, and Ernie Davis, the great Ernie Davis. Also played there. Uh, some of the Chicago Bears played there. And then uh, and most recently, um, some other young linemen came up through Syracuse also. So it was a good school. I graduated with a degree in uh, public speaking. And so I took that degree because I was thinking that course of action that I'm going to, after I finished playing this sport, that I was going to announce games and interview players and do all that cool things like that. The Lord, Lord said, pump your brakes, young man. <laughs> I have a different plan for you. He put me on this pulpit and I have been blessed ever since. I love, love sharing what the Lord has done for me. After four years there, after four years in uh, college, um, you know, during that four years there, I had a great time. I had a, I know this is a um, historically black city, so I joined a fraternity. You might be familiar with the purple and gold of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And so I am an Omega Man from back in the day, from old school Omega Man. And I became a college All-American. All-American. So I was a consensus All-American. That word consensus means that everybody who has an All-American team has you put on it. So now you got to know I'm 20 years old. I'm a 20-year-old man, and the whole world seems to think that I'm the best player at defensive line. What does that do for your ego? You play in front of 50,000 people on a regular basis. I played in the first game of the Carrier Dome and several games thereafter. I played in all-star games. I've got all kinds of awards and accolades. So when it came for me to go to the NFL, it was like the next step of my life. Now, the guy, mind you, a lot of people go through my same life, go through playing those games and don't make it. And that's why I tell young folks all the time, don't aspire to be what's going to take you, what, what, what God has got to bless you with. You know, and I'm not even sure as I think back on it is if it is a blessing from God to have played that sport. Because now as we're looking back now and looking back into how many homes have been wrecked because their father was a professional athlete. How many wives have lost a husband? How many men have taken their lives because they were professional athletes and now they can't play no more? So we don't know. That could be a curse. And now they're trying to say that now involvement in that game can cause traumatic brain injury. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Something that you only heard, you just recently heard when they came from the army. They came from war. But that's what we call that sport, war. We're coming to war, we're in the locker room, we're going to go to war now, you ready to go to war? Okay, I just want to win. It makes you self, 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 all about me. It's all about me. When I used to leave the game, I used to wait for the crowd to cheer my name. I mean, how does that, does the Lord want you out there running around a lineman, hit a man half your size, plant him into the ground, put your knee in his back, your hand on his head, you stand up and do like this and wait for 50,000 people to scream your name. And then if it's the last play and that's the play that caused and the teams have to switch, now you walk up the field and like, that's right. That's right. I'm the man. And you look up in the stands and they got banners with your name on it and banners with your number on it. And you come out the stadium, no matter how late, you know, how long it takes you, because I walk in the stadium, I walk out as fresh as I walked in. So it takes me a while to come back out there into the world. But when I come out there, the world is waiting with papers and pens and cameras. What does that do to you when you're 20 years old? Selfish, coveting, envious. So the NFL decided when it was time for me to get picked in May of 1983, the 
Miami Dolphins with their second pick in that draft chose a defensive lineman out of Syracuse, Michael Charles. And the whole world wandered at the beast from the east. <laughs> and when I first got there, and the first thing I said to Coach Schiller was, okay, I forgive you for picking that scrawny little kid out of Pennsylvania by the name of Dan Marino. Because he picked Dan Marino first, and I forgave him. I spent four years with the Dolphins during that time, though now I got drafted at 20, the youngest man in the league. Two years later, I go to Super Bowl 19. And I'm a player in the Super Bowl at 22 years old. You know how we do. I'm balling. I bring my family in, my sisters, my mother, my father at that time. We all flew out to California. I had a grand old week out there. <laughs> Shortly after that, a couple years after that, uh, my time in Miami was spent. Satan was killing me. I didn't realize it. If you've ever been to Miami, it's not for the weak of heart. If you have any kind of standards about you, you will lose them in Miami. Man, oh man. So then they sent me out to California. I <laughs> said, okay, can't handle Miami, go to California. And Dolphins didn't want to play against me, so they sent me to the other side of the country. And I go to San Diego, and I'm like, whoa. And most of you think San Diego, oh, great, I was just happy to be out of Miami. I was like, thank you, Lord. You spared my life. And you put me in San Diego, uh, San Diego, California, the land of milk and honey. And, but you know me, I'm from New York, New Jersey area. I'm real. I can't handle all that pomp and circumstance that the Californians were about at that time. No disrespect to the Californians. But you know how it is. You can rent a Rolls Royce in California. Didn't know that at that time. A couple years in California, a few years in California with the Chargers. I went on ahead and the, Al Davis decided to bring his team down to Los Angeles. And so they came from Oakland, became the LA Raiders for a couple years. As I played with the LA Raiders and got another shot at the Super Bowl. I had three shots at the Super Bowl and only made it once. But I had three shots. And that was a blessing. When I went to retire, they called me out of retirement to play with the Rams. I played my final year with the Rams. And after Rams, I just they offered me a final contract and I just I didn't have the love in it no more. The game, the plan, the fun of playing just got away from me and I was a little banged up, I couldn't be, I wasn't a top performer like I used to be. And for my pride, I could have stayed during the game, I could have collected a check, I could have taught somebody else, but it was my pride that kept me from continuing. I could do something else, I don't need this. And I didn't. And I walked away without the bullet. Some of my dear friends decided to kill themselves. Four people who I played no Super Bowls with are no longer with us. Couldn't handle life. People leave this sport. It's such a dreadful thing. I didn't get a gold watch, but I did get a football card. Get a football card. Comes with, you know, a pack, a couple other cards, some bubble gum. Cost you a little bit. If you ever get one of those, be sure to mail it to me. I don't know how they do it. They come from Germany. They come from Japan. Somehow these people find I, My own family can't find me sometimes. These people from around the world find me to send me these football cards to sign them and send them back to them. As I move on in life and retire now, I'm single all that time, and about 10 years out of retirement, I was kind of looking. I'm, I'm looking for a few things now. Looking for a church family. I didn't really have a church life. I grew up a Methodist. I wasn't born an Adventist. I grew up a Methodist, and I think that's only because my mom worked at the Methodist church and was the pastor's secretary. But like all youth at that time, uh, when the lights went out and they started doing a prayer, he had such a low, mono, soft-spoken tone. I just kind of closed my eyes and sunk in my chair. And I woke up when the praise team got up and started singing. They all the singers were like, oh, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and I was up singing. And then, but you know what? You leave those churches and you leave those services, and I walk out the same way I walked in. No difference in my life whatsoever. And so when you go off to college and then you go off to the NFL, Satan puts all these things in front of you. And there's so many avenues to go against. 
Ten years after that, I'm working. I have my own company, cell phone company. And I go to uh, Tucson, Arizona. I'm living there where it's nice and quiet, beautiful out there. And at this time, I meet a young Tongan lady in the hospital one day. She's working for a heart hospital. And I just happened to walk in to see some nurses and deliver some cell phones. And I asked them, you know, my way, hey, why don't you take me around and walk me around and introduce me to some people. Some new offices, I could pass out some flyers, my cards, and get some more business. And she said, shortly. And I walked into Tucson Heart Hospital. And standing behind the counter was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And teasingly, I said to my nurse friend, I said, ooh, thank you for introducing me to my wife. I hadn't even met her, didn't even know her name. I just knew that I had to have her. And I knew that I got everything that I wanted. <laughs> After that day, a year later, we committed our service to each other in front of the Lord. And we've never parted. No, literally, never parted. <laughs> She's always with me, and I'm praising for that. Today was uh, yesterday, so everybody got a chance to enjoy the birth of Christ. So I not only enjoyed the season, but I enjoyed being with my family together, like since we were children. So I had my children's family. I had my children there, my sister and her children. Both my sisters and their children. My brother is here with his wife and children. My nephews, all, all everybody's just grown. It's, it's just such a blessing. And we took our family to a nursing home yesterday. And we sang and prayed for them. And I gave a short uh, sermonette for them. And uh, it was just such a blessing. Such a blessing. And so we will finish off tonight with a, a family Christmas dinner. And then we all will go our separate ways by God's grace. Until we meet again, though. Yeah. Until we meet again. I kind of like my story, liken my story to a story in the Bible. If you have your Bibles with you, and I'm sure you do, I'd have you turn to Luke chapter 15. In Luke in chapter 15, the 15th chapter of Luke, in verse 12, the Bible tells, Jesus is telling the story. Now he's sitting around some Jewish people, just a group. And he's sharing with people in a special way, and he wants them to get a point. He spoke in parables for the discerning mind. He wanted you to dive into what he said. He didn't come out and say what he had to say. He had to build the story so that you can get the picture and understand. And this picture is about the prodigal son. Now, a lot of these parables that are in the Bible can relate to your life in one way or the other. This one spoke to mine. This one spoke to my mind. And in verse 12, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Now, you know the Bible's written in the East. So that'd be an Orient family or Eastern family. The goods that fall to him, he's asking for what? His inheritance. The things that he's do, he's do something now. And I want it now, I don't want to wait for it. I don't want to wait till you're dead because you're dead to me now. That's how we do sometimes. I spent all those years working out, running laps, tackling people. My, I want my due now. And they gave me an NFL contract. Gave me an NFL contract. And shortly after they drafted me, I did just like the young person in verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. You know, it's funny the way the Bible words things. that far country, that's a place alien to God's word and God's ways. He wanted to go out away from family, away from the father, away from people who knew him and just wreak havoc. He wanted to go to his own sin city. And he took all he had with him. And so I went, I'm saying, okay, well, why does this feel so good to be? When young folks get paid, why do they want to leave? 
Why do they want to go away? Why do they want to get into some? Why do they want to show everybody else who don't know them how much they have? Flossing. I read a book called The Spirit of Prophecy. Volume 4 of the Spirit of Prophecy tells you that Satan has meetings with his minions. Makes sense, right? He's going after God's people. And God's people carry swords. God's people have the armor of God. I got to break that down. I got to get through the swords. So he has meetings with his minions, and they, and they go something like this. Go. Make the possessors of land and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive light, that they may lay up their treasures here and fix their affections upon earthly things. That's what we do. I want to go to New York. I want to go to L.A. I want to go to Vegas. I want to go where the lights and the glitz and the glamour. I want to go to Paris. I want to go to France. I, I want to do something exotic. I don't want to stay home. I don't want to further God's kingdom. That continues. The meeting continues on. He knows that once he puts these things in front of us, we're going to bite like, like, like fish. And we're going to keep biting till we get hooked and snagged, and now we're gone. He continues on and says, make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truths which we hate. And why does he want us to do that? For we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will finally be separated from God's people. That's where I was at. I'm separated from God's people. I see three of you getting out your car, coming to my door, in your shirt and your tie all dressed. I'm ducking. I'm closing my window because you're going to try to get me converted. <laughs> I'm separating myself from God's people. I don't want to hear the word. You don't have to pray for me. I got it all. I need to be praying for you. I got what I need, but I don't. I don't. As we see, as we continue, it's all pig food. It's mud, it's muck, it's mire. You go through life like that. You play your ball. But then, just like all rides, you never go to the, to the amusement park. And eventually, you got to leave. They close the park, the ride stops. You got to get off the ride. You got to go. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get up out of here. God, get off the ride. And just like the younger son in verse 14, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He began to be in want. Oh, mercy me. What am I going to do now? I can't score no more touchdowns. I can't catch no more passes. I can't throw no more passes. I'm not tackling no more people. People don't want my autographs no more. I'm not getting paid. What am I going to do now? Whoa, whoa, whoa is me. And he went to join himself to a citizen in that country. And some people are not happy there. They're not happy there. And the Bible will tell you as you go on that he, he, he's working with the pigs. He's not... He's working amongst pigs. Now, now, Jesus used that pig analogy because what? He wanted the people to know that he was at his lowest point. You know, back in those days, if you just touching a pig, you couldn't just wash your hands and say, okay, I'm good, right? You had to be ceremoniously cleansed. <laughs> they had to pray over you. You couldn't just walk up and go to back. Oh, I touched the pig. Let me go wash my hands. No, no, no. You need to go through a ritual to get clean before you can hang out with us. We're looking for that. I learned after I became out, and I came out the league, and I got married, and I'm saying to myself, I'm all 
who are not decided followers of Christ are servants of Satan. All, not a few, not a couple, not just the ball players, all who are not decided followers of Christ. If you don't have Christ first in your life, as only in your life, as the center of your life, then you follow and say, it's no gray area. Thus my Bible text, Matthew 6 and verse 24. No man can serve two masters. No man. Because you will hate the one and love the other. You will hate. It just, it just what it does. Or you'll hang on to one and despise the other. Oh, I, can't, I can't be there. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't be humble and trying to get paid. But what can't save you, please? Say, okay, Dean, can't do that. What can save you? My life today. This is devotion, a great devotion called My Life Today. You get that on your app. I know y'all got smartphones. <laughs> Download that app. My Life Today. And only in humble reliance upon God and obedience to all of his commandments can we be secure. Amen. Not just a few, not the ones we like. All of his commandments. You can't just keep the Sabbath and worship other gods. We can't just worship God and steal. We can't say, oh, I've never stole anything and lust on your neighbor's wife. The Lord knows. The Lord knows what you need all the time. In Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. The Lord had just come in and completing the world. He had one more step. Already made a man, and then what did he say? And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I would make a help me for him. The Lord said that. Adam didn't have to go out and try to find a woman. Adam didn't have to get all pimped up, right? Adam didn't have the flaw. And it says that for man, it means it for woman too. I mean, you don't have to go out scantily clad, <laughs> parsley dressed. <coughs> accentuating the goodies that the Lord has bestowed upon you. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Because God has said in his word that he will find a help me for you. He will. But you got to wait because it happens in his time. Another book I like reading. I don't like the past. That's why, he got, that's why we started talking so long. I read it. We both read We're both are readers. And my wife and I read this book, The Advent Home. I read that book, The Advent Home. On page 80. The ad caption in there. Young people too often feel that the bestowal of their affections is a matter in which self alone should be consulted. A matter that neither God nor their parents should in any wise control. These are young folks. Don't want to come to the parents. They're in love. Oh, she makes me feel good. Oh, I can't live without her. And you're 17. You ain't been nowhere. You ain't been nowhere. You 18, you gotta have. Satan is constantly busy to hurry inexperienced youth into a marriage alliance. He's constantly busy doing that. And we're constantly jumping like fish out of water to be with somebody. Trying to make a better way for ourselves. Want somebody to keep us and care for us. Want somebody to love us instead of waiting for God to do it for us. Instead of taking your problems and taking what you need to God and letting God handle your issues, you're looking to set up your own plan. Yeah. 
God says it clearly. After he makes a help meet for you, in Genesis 2, 24, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be of one flesh, man and woman, one flesh. The Lord sanctified and hallowed two institutions at the beginning of creation. The first one, the Sabbath. God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Does he want you to pray for him every day? Yeah. Does he want you to praise him every day? Absolutely. But he wants you to hold the seventh day in reference to him and all that he's done for you. To turn your feet from doing your pleasure on that day. One day, 24 hours. Keep from doing your pleasure. Things that you could do any other day, keep from doing on the Sabbath day. And you'll find favor with Jesus. The next thing he hallowed and consecrated was marriage. A man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave unto his wife. A man and his wife. And we have man trying to change that too. The Bible clearly says in 1 John 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible clearly says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know how we do? We twist scripture around. Oh, oh no, you're going to say, Pastor, that because I don't love because I love the world, God don't love me. He didn't say that. He said that the love of the Father is not in you. You don't have no time to love God because you're too busy loving the high life. You're too busy loving making it rain in the clubs. That's what we do. Why didn't want you to do that? Why did he write that in John 1, well, verse 16? 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but of who? The world. The world. Lust of things of the world. Took me a while. As I got out of playing ball, and I still wanted to play ball. I still wanted to be a baller. I still wanted a nice job. I still wanted to have a job that you look up to and say, oh, man, I wish I had that job. I still wanted to get paid. I still wanted to have big problems. I still wanted to roll up to the clubs and be just on the VIP, on the red carpet, all of that. But in that same devotion that you tell you about, my life today, Another endearing quote that I read. It is not the seeking to climb the eminence that would make you great in God's sight. But it is the humble life of goodness, of fidelity, that would make you the object of heavenly angels' special guardianship. It ain't for us to try to be the president. It's for us to try to be present yeah. in the truth and thoroughly immersed in what Jesus, thoroughly immersed in his written word, thoroughly inspired by the things that he had for us. When Jesus walked this earth, all the angel, all the angel host was at his command. Am I not? Am I lying? The angel host was at his command, yet he did not claim to be anything great or exalted. He was humble. Humble. Thank you. No thank you. Real 
humble. He was a carpenter, working for a wage, a servant for those whom he served. A servant. There was a time I refused to humble myself like that. Now I can't wait to wash your feet. get into our conversion time. Because all this time now, I'm still a baller. How do I become a man of God? How do I become a servant of the Lord? Scripture says in Psalms 107 and verse 17, fools because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities are afflicted. And they draw near unto the gates of death. In 2007, 2007, I was coaching a football team. I'm going to go out, come to Texas, of all places, play the team. And the night before, we have a dinner. And after the dinner, we come back to the hotel, and I'm having problems breathing. And I don't understand why. I'm a healthy man, strong, healthy man. But one of my coaches, one of my assistant coaches was a paramedic, and he said, well, coach, let's call the paramedics up here just to check you out a little bit. And the paramedics came, and they made all this big to-do. You know how paramedics are, lights flashing, trucks coming. <laughs> Saying, come on down, man. I'm just, I'm just got a little chest pain. Just get me to my room. Oh, well, come on in, coach. We'll, we'll take you in for a little observation. A little observation, a little in for a little observation lasted a week. They told me in a few hours that the being there that, hey, we have, we're outside your door because the monitor had your heart skipping beats. It was stopping and starting on its own. Come to find out through my lifestyle, the stress I put on my body, I had an ascending aortic aneurysm. It's like a toothpick through an olive. I had this big lump in my artery, the main artery that pumps blood in and out of my heart. And it's clogged and it's blocked. And that's how a lot of people just die suddenly. Because they say if that burst in you, you bleed out in like 13 seconds. Done. Out. That's it. You got to hope you died in Christ. 13 seconds. I had to have emergency heart surgery. I don't know if you've ever been hurt. I've never even, I don't even go in for colds. My pain tolerance is so high. I couldn't imagine having emergency heart surgery. And they had to explain to me what was going to happen. Well, sir, we're going to have to put you under. Okay? And then when we put you under, we're going to have to saw your breastplate open, your breastplate open. And then after we saw your breastplate open, we're going to have to pry it open, and we had to drain the blood out and put it in the reservoir. And then we're going to have to keep your heart pumping with a pacemaker and your lungs inflated with a cardiopulmonary machine. And we don't know how long it's going to take. We, being the four doctors I'm going to need to work on you. Four different doctors working on me. When you're in that kind of scenario, when you're in that fate, and it's in the man's hand and the Lord's hand, there's nothing to do. You just give up. And just say, Lord, if it's my turn. Now, I've been comfortable. I didn't know the Adventist message. So my mother was passed. And I'm saying, oh, okay, well, I'll just go live, hang out with my mom in heaven. Like it was my right. Like that's the natural place for me to go. I'm going to go to heaven. It don't work that way. Didn't learn that till later. Didn't learn that to have to read in the Bible. That we had to be chosen to go to heaven. We had to be ready to be chosen. I wasn't ready. So as I laid there in that table, I felt them going, working on me. I didn't feel them working on me, but I could feel the fight. The fight, because every day there's a fight going for our souls. Every day. Satan wants you. He has the grip, the grasp on you. And the Lord is trying to take you back. 
the Lord wants you back. Satan had me for 40 years. 40 years. He had me in his hand, in his bosom. We were pallies. We were besties, Satan and I. I didn't harm people. I just didn't do it God's way. I wasn't a bad man. I was just a sinful man. But God saw something in me that we didn't see. And he sent my wife and my sisters who were there in the, in the, in the, in the uh, waiting room. Sent them in to the waiting room. And the pastor came by and they started praying for me. And they got on their cell phones and they called friends and those friends called more friends. And next thing you know, there was a cellular visual prayer line for my return. Fourteen hours. Fourteen hours of open heart surgery, of stitching and mending, of disconnecting and reconnecting. They were done when the Lord opened my eyes and brought me back. Folly. Proverbs 15, verse 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. Folly. Stuff that we do, playing games, riding around in fancy cars, spending money out of control, eating at the king's table, drinking from the cup of indignation. All that is folly to those that are destitute of wisdom. I had no wisdom. I had to be. The God wanted me to be a man of understanding that walketh uprightly. My Lord, how do I do that? Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. Get understanding. So after that, after my surgery, it took me a while to recuperate. I had to breathe again. Learn how to breathe again. Had to learn how to walk again. And so the Lord sent the pastor to help my wife through it. I sent him into my room. And he asked me, Michael, would you be interested in learning more about God and doing Bible study? I said, Pastor, funny you said that. I was thinking about this God. I was thinking about why he would save such a wretched soul that I said I would on, be honored to. But every step I took towards God, Satan put three, four, five obstacles in front of me, always trying to turn me back. Always trying to turn me back. But it didn't work. It didn't work. And I stayed studying. And I studied his word for a year. The psalmist says in Psalms 107 and verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. He sent his word and healed them. The Bible, it's the Bible that got me here. It's the Bible, it's by no, nothing, if it was me, I'd be dead already. I'd be dead thinking I was in heaven. Thinking I'm hanging out with my mother. So after a year, it's 2008. It's resurrection weekend. Easter in the world. And Mark 16, 16 comes to mind. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So on Resurrection Day, 2008, I was baptized the Seventh-day Adventist. The Lord has been blessing me ever since. You know, baptism is not just a dip in a pool. You just don't put on your trunks, throw your towel in, at the cabana and just jump in. Oh, no, no. Baptism is a renewing of your life in Christ. 
leaving the old you behind. You can't come with the new you. You are a new person. It represents a new beginning, a liberation, a changed life. It doesn't mean that you're instantly perfect. No, that would be legalism. But it does mean that addictions to sin should be repudiated and left behind. You can't go down under the water to commit to God to come up and be the same way. Didn't work for me. Okay, Lord, now I'm baptized. I want to follow you. I want to do what you did, how you did it. You just, you just tell me, because I don't know. I'm new to this, and I don't trust no man no more. So he took me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11 clearly states, okay, you need an answer, Michael? You, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse 12. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You didn't get baptized by yourself. I wasn't at home in my, in my tub. I wasn't at the park in the pool. I got baptized in the church with the Lord and the pastor, my family. That's all this came to say. You know what I realized? The psalmist, I'm reading the psalms. I like reading the psalms because King David was one of the Israel's best king. But he was a sinful man too. But he didn't want, he always was so apologetic, he never wanted the Lord to take the Holy Spirit from him. So he says in Psalms 119 and verse 75, Psalms 119 and verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. What I realized is I had to go through that heart thing for you to give me a new heart for you to take this sinful man onto your path. For you to get me off this crooked path, my path, my way onto your way. Now that I'm doing that, Lord, I really see now the Bible clearly tells me my direction from this point forward. Proverbs 16.3. Proverbs 16.3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And the last verse. Psalms 119.67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. Brothers and sisters, is you may not have been a ball player. You may not have been rich. But you've been on a horse, on a journey. You've been to a far country. You've been to a place that's alien from God's way and God's word. And you want to find yourself back. You want to find a way back. And just like the prodigal son, we all come to ourselves. We come to ourselves and realize that even the servants have more than what we have. And we want to come up with this big, big apology and come running back to our father and, and say, oh, please take me back. I'll do anything. No, your father doesn't want to hear that. He just wants you to come just want you to come. Do what I did. Take that step towards him. For every soon as you take that step towards him, he'll know it. As you walk up the driveway, as you walk back towards your father, he'll see you from a great distance off. He won't let you get to him. He'll run out to you, hug you and kiss you and embrace you because he wants you back. 
I'm so glad I took this job. I'm so glad I came back to Johnson. I'm so glad that I found life purpose in him. If you're feeling that way today, and you feel like you want that purpose, you want to renew that purpose with God, you'd like a little prayer, a little, a little small prayer to help you get going, to help bring you back. Because we all have been there. I've been there with you too. I understand how you're feeling. I understand when it's tough and you're a man and you're making your own ways and your way backfires on you. I understand that when you run out of options and you're scared to call home to mama because you're an old man now and you're grown and your pride has got you from seeking help and seeking assistance. I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants to help and wants to give you assistance. If you'd like that assistance, if you want me to pray for you to get that assistance, to have the Lord help you on your journey from this point forward, I'd have you stand. I'd have you stand. Amen. 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 It's a far country. The journey is crooked. That evil way is a wide path and it's easy to walk down. That straight and narrow path, you have to hold your balance. You can't get sidetracked. With it. You have to be focused. The Lord wants focused soldiers in his army. This is no game. This is life. And it's our life to enhance life. Our life to go out and find people in darkness and bring them to a marvelous light. Let us pray. Heavenly gracious Father, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we stand together here as a united front. We stand along with all those who worship this day in your holy day. Lord, we all at some point in time have gone to this far country, a place that's alien to your ways and to your wisdom. But Lord, by your endless, matchless love, in your gracious mercy, you wait for us to come back. You see us, Lord, as we make that first step towards you. And you run to us to catch us before we turn. Thank you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for guiding us here today. Thank you for the life that you sent to us to help us intercede for us. Lord, we need you in our lives in a special way. It is you who makes us successful, not our talents, not our skills, not our money. Lord, you. Lord, we can't do nothing without you, but with you we can do all things through you who strengthens us. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've been with us. We pray that our worship was pleasing to your ears and to your eyes today. I ask, Lord, as these, your saints leave here today, that you go with each and every one of them. Protect them on the highways and the byways. Help them keep you foremost in their minds throughout the rest of this day. Help us to keep the Sabbath holy and turn our feet from doing our pleasure. Lord, we just thank you. We just want to praise you and thank you. Strengthen us and being us with us. Bless our family members. Bless the saints that didn't make it here today. Bless the pastor and the work that he's doing here in this beautiful institution of yours. 
display a blessing upon everything that's here. We love you in a special way, Lord. Amen. church say amen. amen. It is amazing what God can do. I'm glad that the Lord saves us the way he does. Aren't you? And I know sisters, today you can be proud of your brother. God didn't forget him. We sat in my office and talked and I told him what happened to me. And the Lord brought my family across the line because they saw a change in me. And all I want to say to us is let's be real people. This is no time for us to put on anything people need to see what's real, what's right, what's good. That's what they need to see. There are far more fashion designers and all the rest of that other stuff that people do. That, that field is crowded. But being a Christian, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. And that's what we're about. And I praise Jesus for what he does. As we go throughout this year, Thursday, I read a report that just hurt me. Christmas Eve in Nigeria, some people were waiting just to get some gas and something went wrong. There was an explosion. All those people who came just to get some gas to enjoy the holiday were killed right before Christmas, almost to the end of the year, but not quite. 2016 has its problems of its own. I don't know who in this congregation will not be here at the end of next year. But I do know one thing, if you love God, it doesn't matter. And every day you go to bed, you should know that you're in contact with God. Every day you wake up and get ready to leave your house and think you're on the way to your job, to your function, you should have the assurance that I'm with God. And if you don't have that assurance, you are in trouble. Amen? I want to encourage my church, let's not play with God. Let's not play with God. Let's be straight up with God, y'all. Straight up with God. You'll find one of these days, and hopefully it won't be too late, you were in the wrong place. Let not that happen. God is crazy about us, and he wants us so badly. You're looking for a church home? You're looking for a place to grow in? That's why we're here. We want to assist you in your walk with God. We get excited about that. And as you pass out the door, if you do have that desire, just write something down. Give us your number. By the grace of God, we'll make contact with you this week to see how we can assist you. Don't let this year pass without God being your decision. Please don't do that. Thank you.
thank you for visiting with us, oh God. Thank you. Thank you for sending our brother all the way from Texas with a story to tell. Oh, you're so gracious. And I just heard how his heart could have failed him. No one can die without your notice. No one can leave this earth without your say-so. We're glad you said yes for his life. Today, he's returned a thanks to you by telling us what you've done for him. Give that testimony to all of us. Help us to run to and fro and just to proclaim we serve a wonderful risen Savior. He's in this world today. Oh God, thank you for forgiving us for our sins. You saw our foolishness. You saw everything we did, everything we're doing. You see our thoughts. You know our feelings, our bits towards this and that. But you still want us. So today we surrender our hearts to you, oh God. Change our focus. Give us eyesight that we may be able to see that the ways of the world are not going to last. They're not. We don't want to go the wrong way. Turn us around. Jump in our lives like Superman and save us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Thursday night, four, Thursday, four o'clock, have our year in service. I sure hope you feel good about Jesus. I do. I do. I want to thank your family. Thank you all for just thinking to come to our church today. It's an honor. Please, we'd like to have you come back again. Thank you for supporting such a giant of a man. Such a giant of a man. Stay close to each other. Let the Lord use you. God bless. We're going to close the service. Just want to thank you. For those who are visiting with us today, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming to see us. Hope you'll come back again as well. Spread the news. We serve Jesus in this church. Spread the news.